Okay. Um, anybody have any questions about that? Those couple of matrix questions I asked. It was a pretty wimpy homework assignment, but um, okay. So now uh, today we're going to do matrix talk about matrix multiplication. And uh, matrix multiplication, think of it as a series of dot products. Um, so two, one, I'm just making up arbitrary vectors. Two, one, negative two, dotted with negative five, zero, six. Okay. Another way to write this is to do the transpose of the first one and write it as 2, 1, negative 2 times negative 5, 0, 6. So this means transpose in the crazy world of matrices. And, um, or I'm, I'm sorry, this means dot product in the crazy world of matrices. And so the way you calculate this now is, um, 2 times negative 5 plus 1 times 0 uh, plus negative 2 times 6. And you get an answer, I think, of negative 22. Um, so multiplying matrices is just doing this over and over again. So what if you're multiplying these matrices? Um, so I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. How did I come up with those values? And then the next one is, as you might imagine, 10, 11, 12, uh, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Um, and so what you're going to do is to multiply these. Um, is there a top value in this one? No, you, uh, you can just do it like this, just the same way as multiplying two numbers. You can just show the numbers next to each other. Um, yeah, so people don't usually show a dot in there. but. Um, the I, J element of the product is the dot product of um, the ith row of the left matrix and the jth column of the right matrix. Okay, so to come up with um, to come up with the product matrix here, the first element, the 1-1 one, one element, would be the dot product of the first row of the left with the first column of the right. And if you do that, you get a value of 84. Okay? Then to get the so the next one to the right of this 84 what element would that be what's the i and the j for that one first row second column so it's the one two element so we take the dot product of this with this and if you do that you get 90. 
and you keep going on that way. Um, 96, um, 201, 216. Um, let's, let me just draw the dot product thing again for this one. Okay, so for this value, we're going to, um, well, what's the I and the J for that element? Two, three, perfect. So we would take the second row dotted with the third column. That dot product gives you, uh, <laughs> this is not right. Well, what do we get? Um, four. Five, six, dotted with 12, 15, 18, and you get 231. And so the rest of these happen to be, you know, 318, 342, 366. Um, that is the sort of theory of multiplying matrices, but, and you should understand that, you know, but uh, in this class, just use the multiply symbol on your calculator. So enter those two matrices in your calculator, use the multiply symbol. Um, so in TI calculators, just use the multiply symbol. I have a quick question. Yeah. So the first thing we looked at, I think I missed why first matrix term sideways. There is no real why to it. You can just think of that as another definition of the dot product uh, or another. Um, I mean, I suppose there's a why because it makes calculations easier, but that's just how matrix math works. Um, think of that as the definition of the dot product. And then we, we multiply like the first elements or the second elements or the third elements. And then that was our answer. Right. You multiply. So if you see a row matrix multiplied by a column matrix like that, it means you're taking the dot product between those two. And what that means is multiply the first of each and add that to the product of the second of each and add that to the product of the third of each. And that notation only works for matrices that have either one column or one row, or? Uh, well, as you can see, I mean, you, it really, it works for other stuff. It's only called a dot product if they only have, if they're like in one dimension like that. Okay. Yeah. One dimension is the wrong word, but you know what I mean. Yeah. I, isn't the rule that it has to be the same number of rows multiplied by the same number of clusters. Yes, that so you can see that like you can only take a dot product if the vectors are the same length and for that reason the the number of columns in the left matrix has to be the same as the number of rows in the right matrix so for it to work. 2 by 3 can only be multiplied by like a 3 by 2 or something like that. Right. Right. And I, I'm going to give you all those rules in a second, but that's that's right. Any other questions right now? Okay, so here's some stuff to notice. <laughs> so the first one is, <clears throat> um, to be able to multiply two matrices, okay. Um, the number of columns 
of the left matrix must equal the number of rows of the right matrix. Okay, so that's the first thing. If you try to do, uh, you know, um, if this one had a fourth row, then you couldn't multiply these two matrices. Um, second, if the left matrix is a size M by I, and the right matrix is a size I by N, okay, those I's have to match for it to, so you can multiply them. Then the product matrix is M by N. Uh, third, order matters in matrix multiplication. So A, B is not equal to B, A. And actually, based on one and two here, you can, it's not too hard to come up with examples where like A times B is, gives you a defined, you can multiply those two, but B times A, you can't multiply them. Okay. Um, but grouping doesn't matter. So as long as you keep them in the same order, you can multiply uh, them in any grouping. I'll show you what I mean. This is only if you have, you know, more than two matrices that you're multiplying. Um, so if you're multiplying A times B times C, you can do that as A times B and then multiply what you get to C, sorry. Or you can First multiply B times C, and then multiply that to A. And you get the same answer no matter which way you do it. Yeah. Um, so if you were to have three different matrices, um, where like, let's say A times B gives you like an M uh, or MN scenario. Um, if that doesn't allow you to multiply with C, then the same would apply if you did B, C. Right, like yep, exactly. Yeah, if, if it's impossible one way, it's impossible the other way, yep. Uh, a couple of things, uh, let me just show you, like for this class, I told you before the sizes of matrices that we're gonna deal with. Um, so let's see what you get. Um, so some common matrix multiplications in this class. Um, the first one uh, will multiply um, a three by three times a 
times uh, actually instead of writing it like that let me just give um, so we'll have like a matrix like this Um, sorry, erase this again. Let's, let's just call, I just want to think of this as like sizes. Okay. So those aren't zeros. Those are circles. Okay. Last, this is my last time boxes. That's better. It's not funny. <laughs> okay, so if you multiply a 3 by 3 times a 3 by 1, okay, what you get out is another 3 by 1. So you would have a matrix that includes all the, you know, one one yeah, that's um, like, actually, we saw stuff like this in statics. If you're multiplying a three by three mo rotation matrix times like a force vector, you get back out another force vector. Okay. We're going to be multiplying the six by six by a six by one. Yeah. And that's why you really need to make sure you can do this in your calculator. Six by six, six by something, right? Yeah. And then um, the other thing uh, that's going to come up a lot is a three by three times a three by three. I'll just write this like three by three, multiply it by a three by three. What you get out is a three by three. So this will be like multiplying a stress tensor to a rotation matrix or um, I think that's the only one we're going to do, but we'll do it a lot. And then the last one, yeah, unfortunately, is um, if you multiply a six by six. With a six by one, you get out a six by one. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, and in this first one, this is a three by three. This is a three by one, and you get out a three by one. Okay, well, um, so now we're going to think for a second about, uh, like really this is the first mechanics concept that we're gonna deal with, um, the stress tensor. And this is gonna be a super important um, thing in this class. And I always want you to remember um, there's always a correspondence between a stress tensor and a stress cube. Um, so this is just a way to sort of visualize what a stress tensor means. Okay, so um, in order to um, explain what a stress tensor is, um, 
remember that in statics, and we're going to do this again in this class, internal loads and stuff, um, So first, think internal loads. Um, if you put a stick between your hands, and imagine sort of trying to break the stick, So you're flexing this stick to break it. Um, a free body diagram of the stick looks something like this. Uh, you have your fingers pulling down and your thumbs pushing up. Okay. But that doesn't explain where this is going to break, right? Uh, if this explained it, you'd expect this stick to break at either where the fingers are or where the thumb is, but it's not. It's going to actually break somewhere between the thumbs. This is how I brought this up in statics. And um, so the idea of internal loads is, okay, it's not going to break where those external loads are the biggest. It's going to break where, in order not to break, the adjacent material has to apply the biggest loads possible. Okay? Um, and so if you think of this stick in three dimensions, uh, we did our internal loads at a point like this. Well, you know, we talked about it like it was a point, but it's really not a point. It's actually like part of a plane, okay? So we calculated our internal loads at a plane like this. But there's no reason that, I mean, just because we figured out a way to calculate the total loads that one part of the body is applying to the other part of that plane, there's no reason that uh, every point in that plane has to be holding on equally hard, you know? There can be variations along that plane in how likely the thing is to break. So now what we want to do is go from this first analysis we did where we figured out the loads applied at this plane to expressing the loads applied at a point by all the adjacent material, okay? So now we want even more detail. At a given point, What are the loads applied by surrounding material? Okay, so let's start thinking about that. So what I'm going to do is start by imagining like a, this point. We're going to start by imagining a small cube around that point, okay? Or 
around. the desired point. Um, and let's figure out what the loads are applied by the surrounding material. Okay, so here's our cube. How many faces does a cube have? Six. Yep. Uh, and so on each one of these faces, we're going to imagine a fixed joint from statics uh, between the face and the surrounding material. So a fixed joint in three dimensions is three components of force and three components of a couple, right? So we have a force like this, 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 and then we have couple components also. That's just one of the six faces. So um, We have six total load components. Um, that's happening on every one of these faces. Okay, and I've only shown the three that are, you know, three of these faces are obscured to us, so we don't see those. But there's a total of, um, so the loads um, that are applied to the cube by the surrounding material Uh, is represented by how many values? 36. 36, perfect. Yeah. Uh, you would think so, but no. It's where one of the three by three matrices comes in because we're going to be able to simplify some stuff. Um, okay, so now. We don't, we really don't care about this cube. We care about the point at the middle. So you'd imagine there's some kind of limiting procedure going on, right? Well, what's going to happen to these loads as the, uh, so if you take the limit as the cube shrinks to the desired point. Um, all of those loads go to zero. So that's not useful, OK? So instead, represent all of these loads by the force per area and the couple per area. Okay. Well, the benefit of that is that these don't go to zero. And so by thinking about it this way, we can get something meaningful out of those forces. 
What about the couples, though? Well, those couples are, um, you can think of them as pairs of forces that are at different locations on this face. Okay. Um, the forces in those pairs of forces don't go to zero. But the distance between them does go to zero. And so these do still reduce to zero. Okay, so we're going to now uh, represent, okay, so we're going to get rid of the couples on our infinitesimal cube. Okay, so now what do we have? Now we have this cube where on every face we only have three load elements. And I'm going to name these load elements now. Um, if I'm using a coordinate system like this, x, y, z, okay? Um, this new force that we've developed that's, uh, this new load that we've developed that's actually a force divided by an area, I'm going to call lowercase sigma, and I'm going to name it in terms of, so the face is going to be defined by what axis would point out of that face? Like if you imagine this coordinate system at the center, okay? So this over here, where my cursor is, um, that's the positive X face. This one is the positive Y face. This one is the positive Z face. And the ones that are hidden are the one over here, would be the uh, negative x face. The one on the bottom would be the negative y face. And the one in the back would be the negative z face. Okay. And each of these load components I'm going to name with two subscripts. The first subscript represents the face. And the second subscript represents the component. Okay. So the first subscript represents the face, and the second one represents the component of the force per area. Uh, so this one here, it's on the X face. <coughs> so I'm going to represent this as X, and that component is in what direction? What coordinate axis direction? X. X, yep. So this is sigma XX. This one is sigma X. What's the second subscript of that one? Y. Y, yep. And then this one? Z. Z, yep. And on the top, this is the Y face. So um, we got sigma Y. Um, this component is in which axis direction? Y. Yep. This one is Y. What's the axis direction? X. X. And this one is Y, Z. And then here we have Sigma Z, X. Uh, sigma Z, Y, and Sigma, Z, Z. Okay, so from our limiting procedure and everything, we've come down from 36 values. We've cut it in half. So now um, 
we have 18 relevant, you know, loading values. Um, there's a little more that we can say. Um, in order to maintain force equilibrium, I'm not going to go into all the like free body diagrams. Question? Um, for the like hidden faces, would the um, subscripts be like negative x and then still like positive x? Uh, I don't know how you. That would be a reasonable notation. Those are going to go away. I mean, like I'm just about to say something about those, and so like it never really comes up. But yeah, it seems like a reasonable way to. Yeah. Uh, so, just for clarification, this uh, infinitely small cube is yeah. supposed to be in like the midpoint, like the hypothetical break point of this day? Yes, I mean, you could think of that as like, okay, we've gone from uh, calculating the external loads to choosing a plane where we want to calculate the internal loads, okay. and now we have a cube that's lodged in that plane somewhere, and we're just trying to get more fine detail, you know? So it's just a place that we want to find. The yes, answer. that's right. Next time, you imagine a sphere inside the cube. <laughs> no, you don't have to do that. We The cube is enough. Okay. Um, so that would look that is what's next, is a sphere inside the cube. <laughs> and then another cube inside that sphere. Yeah. Um, okay, to maintain force equilibrium, because we're gonna assume this is in static equilibrium, uh, every opposite face uh, must have equal and opposite components. In other words, uh, you know, the, the loads on the negative x face are not independent of the loads on the positive x face. And so what does that do to the relevant load values we need? Um, that cuts these in half again. And so now we're at nine relevant load values. So that comes from force equilibrium. And now we're going to do moment equilibrium. And the way that works is um, sigma ij has to be equal to sigma ji for whatever those are. So like if you're looking straight on, in order for this to be in moment equilibrium, this component has to be equal to this component. We already know that this component has to be opposite of that one, and this one has to be opposite of that one. And so what that does is you can think of that as requiring if we had nine relevant load values that we could put in a three by three matrix, this is telling us that three by three matrix is symmetrical. And so our final result is that the loading on this infinitesimal cube by the surrounding material
is defined by six values. Okay, uh, these six values are sigma xx, sigma xy, sigma xz, Um, now, if you think of the next face, there's a sigma yx, but we don't need that because we just figured out that it has that symmetry. So um, then we have a sigma yy, a sigma yz, and a sigma zz, and that's all you need, those six values. And those are going to be represented two different ways. Um, I guess we'll deal with these in two different formats. The first one is the stress tensor. And the stress tensor is a three by three matrix where we show this symmetry. So this would be sigma XX, XY, XZ. Then because of symmetry, this is gonna be XY again, YY, uh, and yz, and then because of symmetry, this is going to be xz, this is going to be yz, and then we have our last independent value, zz. Okay, um, and I said that there's always this correspondence between a stress tensor and a stress cube, and I want you to always, every time you see a stress tensor, remember that you know, that means this. This is what that stress tensor is showing. That on that infinitesimal cube, you have a, a value xx like that, xy, xz, uh, this is xy again. Sigma x, y again. This is sigma y, y. Um, this is sigma y, z. Uh, this is x, z again. This is y, z again. And this is ZZ. Okay, now look at that. Um, look at that infinitesimal cube. Uh, notice that there's something uh, like a distinction you can make about the the components that are in the plane of the face and the components that are out of the face. Okay. Um, xx, yy, and zz are perpendicular to their face, you know, they're normal to the face, and um, those are the ones that are represented in this main diagonal. So all of these in the main diagonal are called normal stresses. And all the stress elements
off the diagonal are called shear stresses. Um, well, it turns out this is a really mathematically useful way to represent this, but it, it is kind of redundant because you're displaying three of these values twice. And there are cases where you could use just a list of those values. And so the second way that we'll represent this is called the Voigt stress. And the Voigt stress, you can think of it as just a list of values. Um, and it lists them this way. Uh, so sigma uh, xx sigma yy. So first it does all the normals, sigma zz. And then it does the shear stresses in exactly the backwards order of what you would expect. So next it'll be um, yz, xz, xy. So that's the void stress. And I, you know, they decided all that stuff long before I was alive, so I didn't get to choose. What? Yeah, I think, I assume it's John Voigt from Midnight Cowboy, Angelina Jolie's dad, but I don't know that for sure. Um, and another notation that you'll see pretty often, just to make it clear that the shear stresses are something different than the normal stresses. So be used to either of these, be ready for either of these. Sigma XX, Sigma YY, uh, Sigma ZZ, and then tau for the shear stresses. So tau, uh, yz, xz, and xy. And uh, you could, um, you know, just like I replaced those sigmas with taus for the shear stresses, uh, in the void stress, you could replace them up here too, you know, so sometimes you'll see these stress tensors with tau values off the, off the diagonal or in the stress cube, you'll see it. It, you know, the tau just means shear stresses. Um, anybody have any questions about that? Okay, so I want to just do one simple, like, point out one thing. This is pretty much the kind of problems that I'll give you to do. Um, oh, first let me talk about the units. Uh, so the units for stress are the same as the units of pressure. You know, it's going to be force divided by area. Um, And so that means that the SI units are going to be Pascals or Newtons per meter squared. Um, okay, so let's say that you have a stress tensor like um, 5, 0, negative 1. 0, 50, 2, negative 1, 2, negative 10. First, you know it has to be a symmetric matrix, and this is, so that's okay. And let's say this is in units of megapascals, so all of these would be times 10 to the sixth pascals. Draw the corresponding stress cube.
And let's also do it in the void form. Uh, so the stress cube, um, our xx is five, our xy is zero, our xz is negative one, or in other words, it's one going this direction. Then on the y face, uh, we have the yy is 50, positive 50. The yz is 2. And then uh, because of symmetry, uh, we have 1 going this way. Um, in the y direction, we have 2 going this way. And in the z direction, negative, you know, so going in the negative z direction, we have 10. And that's in megapascals. So that can help you sort of visualize what the loading is like at this point. As far as the Voigt form, um, we have 5, 50, negative 10. And then yz, xz, and xy. And this I would uh, represent as um, like the stress matrix with a V for Voigt. Any questions about that? Yeah. Uh, so would this, these numbers have some specific, like, uh, I guess I don't see how you can get like actual quantifiable numbers from an infinitesimally small field. <coughs> yeah, right. Well, um, Two-thirds of this class is just going to be uh, going from loading scenarios to figuring out how to calculate those stresses. So for now, we're not getting into that, but a huge part of this class is going to be that. Okay. Yep. So <laughs> I'm guessing some megapascals would be like pascals or nanopascals or something? Uh, we um, <clears throat> Usually, I mean, if you're dealing with engineering materials, you don't care. Like, they can all withstand stresses up into the at least hundreds of thousands, almost always like millions, billions kind of thing. And so uh, we won't ever deal with values smaller than about a megapascal for the most part. Otherwise, they're just sort of not worth your your time, you know what I mean? What's the super high value? Um, what? Does it matter if this, like, do we care if the stress cube, is it an equilibrium? Yeah, it, we're always going to assume it's in equilibrium, it's okay. in static equilibrium. <laughs> So yep. if, if we were to like analyze these forces, they would all cancel out. Uh, yeah, okay. that's right. Um, what was the small force you were talking about? The small force in D form? Oh, it wasn't a force, it was a deformation. It's the strain. Strain is really small. Yes, so in engineering materials, concrete, steel, you know, you're going to tend to be dealing with stresses in the millions of pascals, at least, and strains, which is a unitless value, uh, smaller than 10 to the fourth. Okay. Ten, smaller than 10 to the minus fourth. Right. Yeah. Much smaller than 10 to the fourth. Okay. Have a good weekend. See you Wednesday.